Welcome to Political Cartoonists and the George W. Bush Presidency. Uh, my name is Larry Levy. I'm Dean of the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University. Uh, University. Um, it's been a long week, believe me. Um, and my, my only relevance to this gathering is that for 20 years I sat on the Newsday editorial board and it was my distinct pleasure to have uh, adjoining offices with Walt Handelsman, who was the cartoonist at Newsday. And, to sit with him in editorial board meetings, the only artist among a sea of writers, was just a treat. He always kept us loose and on our toes. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce um, Rosalind Mazur, uh, my co-moderator. Uh, Ms. Mazur has spent half of her remarkable career in private law practice and the last half in public service in Washington. During her days in private practice, she represented the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists as friends of the court in the landmark case between Jerry Falwell and Larry Flint, publisher of Hustler Magazine. She wrote a path-breaking brief in support of the cartoonist's cause, path-breaking for two reasons. First, because it contained an appendix of political cartoons over the centuries, featuring some that really skewered their subjects. And second, because by all accounts, her advocacy for the cartoonists turned what could have been a death knell for the First Amendment to a ringing victory for free speech, even though the main protagonist in the case was Larry Flint, hardly a sympathetic figure uh, to the Rehnquist Court, certainly. In a landmark unanimous ruling in 1988, the Supreme Court held in favor of Hustler Magazine and for the right of cartoonists to entertain and inform us with their sometimes savage, cruel, not, not you guys, right? Uh, but insightful editorials about politics and public figures. She's earned an enduring place in the hearts of these special artists and their fans through her career-long support for the cartoonist's craft. Ms. Mazur is a magna cum laude Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Syracuse University, go orange, and received her law degree from the Columbus School of Law at Catholic University. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Mazur to Hofstra to induce and introduce our panel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the second time, I'd like to thank Hofstra for including the unique perspectives of some of our country's uh, national treasures uh, for political cartoonists who um, have drawn uh, President George W. Bush, among other presidents and cultural icons throughout their distinguished careers. Uh, to my immediate left um, is Steve Breen. Uh, Steve was born in Los Angeles and grew up in neighboring Orange County, the second oldest of eight children. He attended the University of California at Riverside where he earned a bachelor's degree in political science. It was at the university that he started drawing editorial cartoons for his school newspaper, The Highlander. In 1991, Steve won the Scripps Howard Charles M. Schultz Award as the top college cartoonist and the John Locker Award for Outstanding College Editorial Cartoonist. So all you budding editorial cartoonists out there, it starts in high school and college. Breen was about to become a high school history teacher when the Asbury Park Press offered him a job in the art department in 1994. He became the full-time editorial cartoonist there in 96. In April 1998, Steve won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. He won the Pulitzer Prize again in uh, 2009 for, among other works, uh, his depictions of the 2008 presidential campaign, which of course has been the topic of discussion at this conference, the 2008 financial crisis, and drugs in Major League Baseball. In July 2001, he returned to his home state to join the staff of the San Diego Union Tribune. His editorial cartoons are nationally syndicated by Copley News Service and regularly here in the New York Times, USA Today, Newsweek, US News and World Report. His comic strip, Grand Avenue, appears in more than 150 newspapers across the country. Next to Steve is Mike Peters. Mike is recognized as one of our nation's most prominent cartoon artists for his outstanding work as both a political and, comics and comic strip cartoonist. Um, as eloquently phrased by a colleague, Mike is the Peter Pan of the cartooning world. Boyishly charming, good with a rapier, and doesn't spend a lot of time on the ground. 
Mike was born in St. Louis, Missouri, where he graduated uh, from Christian Brothers College High School. He was awarded a degree of Bachelor of Fine Arts from Washington University and began his career on the art staff of the Chicago Daily News. The following year, he began two years of service with the United States Army as an artist for the second, 7th Psychological Operations Group in Okinawa. After Vietnam, his mentor, the renowned World War II artist Bill Malden, helped him find a cartooning position on the Dayton Daily News in 1969. His cartoons became syndicated in 1972. In, 19, in 1981, Mike was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Journalism, and in 1984, the award-winning Mother Goose and Grimm comic strip was born, all with the help of his uh, wife Marion, his best friend and business partner. Uh, I'm happy to say that his daughter Molly is here with us today, one of his three wonderful daughters. Um, Peter's Mike has done a wonderful, if you haven't seen it, 14-part uh, interview series, The World of Cartooning with PBS. Next to Mike Peters is Ann Telness, who creates animated editorial cartoons and a blog of print cartoons um, and sketches for the Washington Post. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 2001 for her print cartoons. Among the works acknowledged by the Pulitzer Committee were cartoons of the 2000 campaign, um, in which, among other things, she depicted the choices as different types of cereal and different ingredients. I think we'll see that today. And depicted the uh, role of the Florida legislature in the 2000 um, political presidential campaign. Um, Anne attended the California Institute of the Arts and graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts, specializing in character animation. Before beginning her career as an editorial cartoonist, and worked for several years as a designer for Walt Disney Imagineering. She has also animated and designed for various studios in Los Angeles, New York, London, and Taiwan. Um, and last but not least, we have Michael Lukovich. Um, Mike is an editorial cartoonist who's worked for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution since 1989. He is the 2005 winner of the Rubin, the National Cartoonist Society Top Award for Cartoonist of the Year, and is the recipient of two Pulitzer Prizes. Um, among the works acknowledged and uh, relevant to this conference um, by the Pulitzer Committee were depictions of 9-11, uh, um, Katrina, and the war in Iraq. Uh, Mike was uh, born in Seattle, Washington. Um, he attended the University of Washington, where he earned a degree in political science. For two years after graduation, um, Mike sold cartoons on a freelance basis to the Everett Washington newspaper while working as an insurance salesman. He began his uh, cartooning career with the Greenville News in South Carolina in 1984 and moved to the New Orleans Times-Picayune later that year. In 1989, he began his career with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, where he continues today. While at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Mike won the 1995 Pulitzer Prize and 2006 Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. Um, uh, wonderful cartoons and the, the Pulitzer Committee acknowledged during the 2006 submission included uh, Katrina, 9-11, and the war in Iraq. So to get our uh, wonderful panel started, um, I'd just like to say that this is going to be a little different than the other sessions you've attended. Um, looking at the program and listening to a couple of the sessions, a lot of the uh, comments of the panelists you've heard before to this session are couched in uh, to put this in context for, on the one hand, and on the other hand, these very carefully nuanced um, explanations and assessments of the Bush presidency. <coughs> this session is the antidote for that, right? Uh, it's not going to be like that. Um, Scholars have sometimes uh, looked for hints or declarations of what our presidents think of political cartoonists. Famously, Richard Nixon put Paul Conrad, the Pulitzer Prize-winning cartoonist for the LA Times, on his enemies list. President Clinton, 10 years ago at Hofstra, uh, right here at the session on his presidency, said it was unfortunate that his political opponents turned three-dimensional human beings into two-dimensional cartoons, 
at which point two of our panelists here who were in the audience stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, that's what we do. That's what we do. Um, we also know uh, we have some uh, declarations from what the United States Supreme Court thinks about political cartoonists and their depiction of our presidents. The case that Larry mentioned um, that the Cartoonist Association was involved in um, led to a unanimous decision uh, upholding the basically the right to inflict emotional distress by political cartoonists. And Justice Rehnquist, who wrote the uh, unanimous opinion, said this about the role of cartoonists. Lincoln's tall, gangling posture, Teddy Roosevelt's glasses and teeth, and Franklin Roosevelt's jutting jaw and cigarette holder have been memorialized by political cartoonists with an effect that could not have been obtained by the photographer or the portrait artist. From the viewpoint of history, it is clear that our political discourse would have been considerably poorer without them. Um, it was hard to find, but I did find some uh, representation of what President George W. Bush thinks about political cartoonists. He wrote um, a book in 2010 called um, Decision Points, and in it, he talks about um, the critical decisions he made in his presidency, one of which was to retain uh, Vice President Cheney on the ticket the second time he ran um, he, he ran for uh, office uh, the, uh, for re-election. And he said um, that uh, Vice President Cheney came to him in 2003 and offered to um, uh, move on and have President Bush have the opportunity to uh, select another running mate in the upcoming election. And here's what uh, President Bush said. I did consider his offer. I talked to uh, Andy Carl, Carl Rove and a few others about the possibility of asking Bill Frist, the impressive Tennessee senator who had become majority leader, to run with me instead. We all expected 2004 to bring another close election. While Dick helped with an important part of our base, he'd become a lightning rod for criticism from the media and the left. He was seen as dark and heartless, the Darth Vader of the administration. Dick didn't care much about his image, which I liked, but that allowed the caricatures to stick. One myth was that Dick was actually running the White House. Everyone inside the building, including the Vice President, knew that was not true, but the impression was out there. Accepting Dick's offer would be one way to demonstrate that I was in charge. The more I thought about it, the more strongly I felt Dick should stay. I hadn't picked him to be a political asset. I'd chosen him to help me do the job. That was exactly what he had done. He accepted any assignment I gave him. He gave me his unvarnished opinions. He understood that I made the final decisions. When we disagreed, he kept our differences private. Most important, I trusted Dick. I valued his steadiness. I enjoyed being around him, and he'd become a good friend. As one of our, at one of our lunches a few weeks later, I asked Dick to stay, and he agreed. So we can see that um, our presidents have um, at times been challenged by the depictions uh, by political cartoonists. And to start off our session today, I just thought I'd lead with a couple of questions. Um, so the order of battle is for us to talk a little bit about their, the depictions of George W. Bush. Then uh, each of our cartoonists is going to uh, show some of their uh, Bush and Bush era cartoons. If we have time, a couple of our cartoonists are going to draw some live sketches, and then we're going to invite your questions. So to kick it off, let's start. Um, down at the end with Mike, Mike Blakovich, I wanted to ask, um, was George W. Bush good to you as a cart cartoonist from a creative point of view? Boy, yeah, gosh, you know, um, you know, uh, you mentioned Paul, someone mentioned Paul Conrad earlier, and he used to talk about how Nixon was this, was the Nixon administration was like the greatest time in cartooning history. <laughs> but to me, the golden era was the Bush administration because, you know, first of all, you had 9-11, that they knew something was coming, they didn't really do anything about it. And then you had a, a misled us into Iraq, and then you had Katrina, and then you had the economic meltdown. The only way the Bush administration could have been any better for cartoonists is if they had discovered Cheney and Bush naked together in the Oval Office. <laughs> then it would have been fabulous. But, but yeah, so that's, they were, they were great. They were great. 
Job was easy. Easy? How about this? It, yes, I mean, it was, and he's right. I mean, it, it doesn't make your job easy, but it gives you a lot of um, material to actually draw from. Um, at first, at first I found it, I, I didn't really get him at first. I mean, I, you know, I knew about his policies and, and really what concerned me more was his reproductive policies and things. And he did a lot of cartoons about that. But I drew him basically kind of small, like a child, which quickly changed <coughs> after um, nine eleven and all the civil liberties issues and things. So I, I think that, sh that happens with every president that we deal with. We tend to change how we depict them. But in his case, it was a very marked change. Why did it, why did it change? Well, because of 9-11, because of what that entailed, because of what the administration decided to do. And then, of course, once um, they decided to go to war with Iraq. I mean, we had so many different issues to deal with. I mean, we're cartoonists, but I think a common way that we describe ourselves is we don't take ourselves very seriously, but we certainly take what we do seriously. And it's, it's a very, I know the word cartoon kind of brings up the image of something just funny, but you know, editorial cartoons by their nature are visual opinion. You know, we have to have an opinion first. We just happen to do it with pictures and with words. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, That's right. I just finished that explanation. I, I, you I, I know. I'm sorry. I'm doing it all right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. There was, there was this lady um, who, um, who I met um, uh, in 2000. That's when you started going to Iraq. Is, is that when Iraq started? Yes. 2000. And um, she's real pretty. And I met her at a at a uh, at a, a cocktail party. And um, and I was saying I can't friggin' believe that they're taking the troops out of Afghanistan and and going to Iraq. And I said Af Afghanistan are the guys who 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 did the bombing and 9/11. And and she said, Mike, um, surely the president and vice president knows a little bit more about what is going on than a cartoonist does. <laughs> and of course, they don't. They didn't. <laughs> the cartoonists were right. The ones who, who said, what the, what the hell are you doing? You know, coming out of, out of Afghanistan and going to Iraq. I, I, what, what? And, and the letters that well, I know we got, and I know you must have gotten some, we all must have gotten some about who, who criticized the war. The letters we got from people who were saying, how dare you, how dare you, you know, you know, criticize this man who has to deal with all this stuff and looking for weapons of mass destruction and all that. And, and you know, um, um, oh, the, the smoking gun is going to be the atomic bomb and all that kind of stuff. And, and and many of us kept saying, yeah, but, but see, he took the people, took our, our people out of Afghanistan and took them into a, Iraq. And those were not the people who started, who, who did 9-11. And that's what this whole thing was about. And they were all saying, oh, how dare you say that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's our job. Uh, that's our job. Yes. That is our job. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh. And I, to paraphrase uh, uh, Art Buckwald, who was talking about Nixon, but I believe uh, that uh, that Bush was our Camelot, you know, <laughs> a cartoonist Camelot. We do best when the four horsemen, the death, and pestilence, famine, and whatever, um, <laughs> um, Cheney, um, all <laughs> all happen, and uh, uh, we do our best when that happens when it's horrible going on, when things are horrible going on in our country. And for sure, uh, this was my best time as a cartoonist because, because uh, so many things that, that, uh, uh, that the Bush administration did were um, obviously, obviously to me a mistake, you know, so, okay. Uh, I agree with what these guys said, to keep it short. Uh, uh, Clinton was pretty good, but there was more material with Bush because of all the drama, you know, with the wars and stuff. Uh, and I am particularly lucky because uh, there was a period there, I think, where I had 
Bush and Cheney in the White House, and then I had uh, Schwarzenegger in Sacramento. Uh, I'm, I'm from California, so I had a ton of material for a couple of years there, so it was great. All right. Uh, is this mic on? Good. All right, so now for the, the, the meat of this presentation, we'll start with Steve, um, who is going to show some of his uh, Bush era cartoons. All right, here we go. Okay, so I am Steve Breen. I am the cartoonist for the Union Tribune in, in San Diego, and I'm the uh, token conservative on the panel. And um, uh, I, uh, so I, I uh, supported George W. Bush initially, um, and because uh, I, you know, I, I, I guess I was sick of Clinton and Gore, and and um, and Bush seemed like the kind of guy you'd, you'd want to have a beer with, and uh, and plus I was, I'm pro-life, and you know Bush is pro-life, so th there were various factors where I thought, eh, you know, this will be a good administration, um, and uh, and you might be surprised by some of these cartoons because things did change. So we had, of course, 9/11. And uh, this cartoon kind of worked out because the two L's in intelligence, you know, formed a twin towers of their own. Um, uh, and uh, of course, 9/11 became politicized, and um, everyone, or each party, you know, had their ideas on how to proceed forward. You know, because this was just this unprecedented thing. You know, none of us knew what was going on or what direction we were going to take, and. Um, the Republicans, though, were in office, led by Bush and Cheney and others, and uh, they had their ideas about which direction to go. We've established a clear link. Um, and uh, it, it was really, it was frustrating because um, I was... I was drawing in San Diego, and it's a, it's a very military town, right? And uh, a lot of retired military, it's pretty conservative. And uh, it was uh, people there in 2001, of course, you know, we, I think we all supported Afghanistan, right? Um, uh, but uh, 2003 came along, and uh, a lot of us uh, thought it was a horrible idea, even uh, conservatives. Or people, I mean, I don't know if I consider myself a conservative. I, I lean conservative on, on a lot of issues. But I hate to say I'm a Republican. I hate to say I'm conservative because I don't like labeling myself. But, um, but I, I, just, I just knew there was something in your gut that just felt like, whoa, this is a horrible idea to go in there and, and to, to get rid of, of this guy, no matter how awful Saddam was, to just go in there and, 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 and kick him out and then nation build. It just, it just seemed bad. But yet everyone around you was saying, no, we got to do this, and, uh, you know, how dare you not support the president right now in this time of, of national tragedy. Um, and we quickly, quickly saw that, that Iraq was not a good idea. Uh, all kinds of problems. Um, another hostage. Uh, there's George W. Bush in, in, the, uh, in the video. Um, um, and, um, and, uh, and then, Bush's, uh, Bush's other uh, policies uh, with, the, with the war on terror uh, were good fodder. Presidential hearing aids, just domestic spying. Um, uh, spending, spending under Bush was, uh, was pretty crazy. Washington Monument, the Bush Monument. Thank you, Mike. Um, uh, the, uh, so I did this cartoon. This cartoon ran the same day that uh, Bush was on that aircraft carrier outside of San Diego, you know, with the mission accomplished thing. Yes. And, um, and I got a ton of angry calls and letters into the paper saying how disrespectful this was and how dare I, poor timing and all this. And what, a couple of these people were executives within our news organization mm -hmm. who uh, they, they wanted my head on a platter. Uh, Right, right, but no one, it's like these, they didn't, they don't see these things at the time. They're right. so caught up in like the, the beating of the war drums right. that they don't hear or see. Yes. Um, and so, um, oh, here's a uh, Bush Cheney, or not, I'm sorry, Bush Kerry cartoon back from uh, 04 during the campaign. Uh, we elect George W. Bush, the shoot from the hip wartime president, and then there's a Kerry bus. Carry 2004, bland yet thoughtful leadership for America. And um, there was a lot of talk of hybrid vehicles at the time. 
Um, I'm moving through these fast. Okay, I'm at four minutes and 30 seconds. Okay. Um, okay, so um, another big, uh, another sad factor of this, uh, the, 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 just this, this direction we took after 9-11 was what it did to our, our, our stature in the world, our, um, our uh, <laughs> reputation. As we perceive our image in Iraq, and there's John Adams, you know, yeah. liberty, democracy, and as our image is perceived. <laughs> uh, um, that, that's great. Thank you. Uh, would be uh, the bald eagle, you know, going out of the loam, prisoner of youth, Iraq war, man, WMDs. Um, Guantanamo Bay. I mean, I know, I know these are very complex issues, and Guantanamo Bay, you know, we, 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 we capture all these bad guys, and then what do we do with them? I mean, I know it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it just seemed like there was something wrong with Guant Guantanamo. What are we charged with? How long are you going to detain us? Hello, Texas Hold'em. <laughs> That's uh, great. Hey, uh, Mike, thank you. You're the best. <laughs> I, love, I, I love being on a panel with Mike Peters. Um, and, uh, 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 and then, okay, Katrina. Katrina was another big story in the Bush administration. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, and um, and then here's my I should end with a laugh, but this one isn't really a laugh. But uh, the seven deadly sins of the meltdown: um, envy, gluttony, sloth, pride, greed, lust, and wrath. And it's it's kind of hard to see because this is in color and a lot of like intricate artwork that you're missing out on. But um, envy, this woman is like looking for this bigger house, you know, so she's gonna go get a home equity line of credit and. And same with this guy, he's buying a you know, plasma TV and a, a, a RV. And, and then uh, sloth is, is uh, the, uh, politicians or bureaucrats or whatever I've labeled that guy, regulators. No, regu regulators. And they're asleep at the switch. And then there's uh, pride with both parties saying, you know, hey, don't blame us. And then the greed and lust that was so rampant on Wall Street. And then, you know, the wrath, the, the angry people who lost their, their 401ks. It just, it just, sometimes, you know, you do a cartoon and, um, and everything just kind of falls together, and, and, and those, those, are the, those, are the good, those are the good days when things kind of just fall into place. So, my Bush cartoons, thank you. Wow. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm not starting yet. I got uh, my timer. You better start. No, no, I stop it, stop it. It's not time yet. Okay, now, now, now it's time. It's time. It's time now. Okay. Um, um, you know, I'm just going to start uh, with my cartoons because we only have six minutes. Um, Bush was one of the big people um, to have loved um, all the Saudis. You know, he would go and visit the Saudis. They would come and visit him and, and stuff. And, and so anything the Saudis did, were, were I mean, uh, uh, Bush would, would say, no, it's not a problem and all that kind of stuff. And so... I, I, I did a, um, love means never having to say you're Saudi, you know, you know. After, after their first election, uh, Cheney, uh, uh, Cheney uh, uh, came into the office and he said, uh, uh, we finally have our mandate, and Bush says, but I thought that was illegal in, seven, in 11 states, you know. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, now this happened during, during the time, um, uh, a lot of the prosecutors um, in the states were being uh, 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 were being let go, and, and I forget why. I forget why they were being let. They were, they were being let go. Okay, and um, so I had I had uh, two guys talking, and they're saying uh, the Justice Department is handing out more pink slips, and the other one says, "I hear they belong to J. Edgar Hoover," you know, because. It, uh, yeah, Edgar Hoover was a, well, I can't, never mind, not, but uh, um, this I loved because I, I was hoping that uh, Fred Thompson would stay in the, would, would, would stay in the, uh, 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 would have stayed and actually ran for president. He started to and then he got sort of bored, but, but I had uh, the charisma of Fred Thompson. He's happy, electrifying, gleeful, joyous, dashing, and ecstatic, you know. It, it took me a while coming up with the right words because I, I had all these words, but, but uh, these uh, ec ecstatic was, uh, was the thing that it got me. Uh, um, this was near the end of the Bush administration, and, uh, uh, and 
everybody had been talking about um, why did Bush and Cheney want to go to war in, uh, in Iraq. And, um, and they did up this cartoon. It's amazing uh, to do, you know, we all do up cartoons on the same topics. And uh, we all, and that's the problem, because what you try to do is find something unique, something special, or some way of putting this across. I, I had been sitting all day trying to come up with this idea, trying to come up with some idea, trying to explain why I thought they went to, went, went to war. And, um, um, and I thought of this, and I thought, surely someone has done this. And so I checked the, I checked the internet, trying to find this. I couldn't find anything. I even, I even said what the cartoon was, trying to see if somebody else had done this. And, and, um, and it said, why Bush and Cheney went to war? And it said, connect the dots. And I thought that was really, you know, uh, uh, Tony Auth, who just passed away just six months ago, who is a great cartoonist, he always talked about doing the perfect cartoon was doing a cartoon in 20 minutes. I mean, that was his perfect. And I did this in 20 minutes. How cool is that? And I was happy about it. And no one else had done it, you know? So I thought, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Um, this next one is, is kind of um, another reason what I thought, uh, this was in uh, Bush's uh, second, second term, and um, I think, and, um, and why I thought um, was the underlying um, message that Bush and Cheney were giving all during his time, and it says, it said, and I had, I had him holding a little uh, flashlight under his face saying, be afraid, be very afraid, and and they did that in all different kinds of ways. Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, and I know they were trying to do the right thing um, uh, when, they were tr when they were coming out with the color-coded terror alert, <laughs> you know. And we all, oh God, we're on yellow. Oh Jesus Christ, he's on yellow, you know, and stuff. And, and trying to, and trying to uh, uh, make you afraid, um, but also trying to save America, like they were uh, saying. But, but really, they were making us afraid, and so... Um, this happened, this next thing happened. Um, the last uh, vice president to ever shoot someone was, was uh, Raymond Burr. I mean, not Raymond Burr. Uh, 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 Burr, Burr, uh, who shot, who shot uh, um, um, our Secretary of Treasury, you know. And so, and so when this guy did it, um, a, a book was coming out that was popular. I, I put these two together. And, and it said, uh, eats, shoots, and leaves. And, and one of the ladies said, it's Dick Cheney's biography. And I thought there was a, a, a good, a, you know, a synopsis of uh, what he did. Uh, this is another uh, thing of um, how much um, uh, the uh, Bush loved the, uh, loved the Saudis. Uh, one of the Saudi princes came to uh, visit um, uh, uh, Bush at his ranch in Texas. And it was very dear. And... Um, and so he's walking, and two of the, his, of, of the Saudis' wives are behind him. And says, I remember when Prince Abdullah used to look at me like that. You know, it's so lovely, just so lovely. He was just terribly in love. Um, this is not very good, but I thought it was cute. And I forget, uh, oh, it was, about, um, it was about when Bush was talking about uh, that we can't... Uh, do anything to harm the, uh, not the ovaries, but the little, uh, those little bitty things, you know, the uh, little, uh, what? Embryos, the little embryos. And so, uh, he, and he started talking about intelligent design. And so I had him as Curious George, kind of uh, in looking into intelligent design. And I got a lot of trouble for this one because they, I was saying that he was a monkey and, and well, yes, uh, okay, you can say that. Uh, this next thing was um, during during um, uh, Hussein's um, his 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 trial, and uh, he was worried about you know he was he was getting ready for his trial, and right before the trial, Michael Jackson had had a trial and he came out innocent, and so um, so here you have. Um, uh, um, you know, Saddam Hussein is still in prison, and his uh, one of his guys is saying it's not going to work, Saddam. You know, and I, I thought it was uh, appropriate uh, giving it across this thing. Here's a cartoon that I wasn't going to have, uh, but but then uh, Anne took a look at it and liked it. Uh, 
uh, this was about um, uh, our, um, well, uh, it's, it was around Christmas, and there was a toy that was very popular at the time, and it was right when they were talking about Guantanamo. And so I said, new from the White House, torture me Gitmo. You know, it was a, see, I, you know, there was a thing where you would laugh, okay, uh, never mind. Uh, no. Uh, yes, r right, I know, I, <laughs> I know, I know, it's very fun. Um, this is uh, a uh, conservative um, uh, talk show, um, Talking Head, uh, was on, and she said a couple of bad words, and I mean, so, uh, said a couple of uh, outrageous statements, and so I did this, here's a priest, and it says, cancel our exorcism, it's just Ann Coulter, you know, and, and you see her head is turned backwards, and she's, Barfing up the green, uh, when I put the green stuff in there, it was the green. And uh, this next one, I just have three more. Um, and I, and how, how long have I been up here? Twelve. Twelve. No, stop it. Oh, I'm, no, I'm, I haven't even said anything. I've just talked about my freaking cartoons. Um, uh, uh, a little girl is coming up to uh, her grandfather, who, which is uh, Dick Cheney, and she says, Grandpa, could you teach my puppy a trick? And he says, sure, speak, speak, you know. I love that cartoon because it seemed to work, you know, and, and, uh, and I heard that he was mad at that. Um, this happened, this isn't about Bush and Cheney, but it is about um, uh, Prince Harry. And um, he was found, during this time, he was found um, going to a Halloween party, and he had a... Uh, and he had a Nazi symbol on his, on his arm, and everybody got very upset, you know, got very upset that, um, uh, that he was wearing this Nazi symbol when he's a member of the royalty. And so I have, um, I have his father, Prince Charles, and, um, and, and his bride coming up, and he says, Harry, how could you walk around with that horrible thing on your arm? And Harry says, I was going to ask you the same thing, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, it was a, a cartoon. I was making fun of, of her, and, the, and then um, and and then uh, Roz said we could do a cartoon, any cartoon we wanted of, of some time later, if you wanted to do it. And this was my favorite cartoon of um, of uh, of Bill Clinton, and um, and it was real simple. And it's just um, I'm with stupid, you know, and and a little arrow arrow there. And so, um, thank you very much. Okay. There, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, so the first one is um, the Supreme Court decision in 2000 that effectively gave Bush the win for the presidency. Uh, you see Chief Justice Rehnquist, Scalia, O'Connor, uh, Thomas, <laughs> and uh, Kennedy. Oh, yeah, that was, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you can just go ahead. Sure. Um, Dick Cheney put together an energy policy task force with, um, you know, oil interests, and uh, the meetings weren't open to the public. And we didn't find out for quite a while who exactly attended those meetings, but there were oil and gas companies and other interests. <laughs> and uh, the Bush um, environmental policy. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that uh, initially in the beginning of the Bush, the first Bush um, administration, I, I was concerned about reproductive policies, and one of the policies they had was to um, 
to start an abstinence-only sex education, which works really great until it doesn't. <laughs> and then we had 9-11, and uh, of course that changed a lot of things. Um, in the editorial cartooning community, I mean, it was it, it, it was difficult. I mean, we're we're pretty used to getting criticism, but it was a really difficult time to criticize anything against the administration because Americans, their tolerance level at that point was not very high. You know, people were shocked by what had happened, and it it just was a very difficult time to do anything that criticized what the administration did. Um, I had colleagues that not necessarily were threatened with their jobs, but they got the feeling that if they did do something that criticized Bush or a policy, that their editor wouldn't like it. So it was a really interesting time to speak to your colleagues. At, at that point, I was a freelancer. I was on my own. I was syndicated, but I wasn't that... I never had anyone try to tell me what I could or could not do. It was just the question of the intensity of the um, reactions I had to cartoons through emails or letters or whatever. Uh, this one refers back to the Red Scare in the 1950s where, you know, if, if you were connected in any way to communism, you know, you were considered anti-American. So I, I thought, well, it's kind of what we were going through right after 9-11. If you weren't looked at as being patriotic, the red, white, and blue scare instead of the red scare, then, you know, you were, you were attacked for it. Uh, along the same lines, uh, maybe you've read Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. So the woman says, thank you, Mary. <laughs> says, adulterer. And the other one says, no, anti-American. I question the administration's policy. Next. You know, the Bush, the Bush administration, they, they held on to the, the line that they <laughs> had not made up their minds about taking military action in Iraq until much later. And come to find out, you know, after the release of the Downing Street memo, that that really wasn't the case. They had been thinking about it for a while. And, uh, you know, 9-11 was very convenient. Next. The invasion of Iraq. And that's, Cheney is one of my favorite, um, favorite, <laughs> if that's the right word. I did a lot of cartoons about Cheney, um, probably more than Bush even. Uh, I don't know what people are talking about. There's plenty of cheering. And then we see all the people that could possibly be making money off of a war. Next. And you might remember a famous line from 9-11 was, let's roll. And, uh, you know, George W. Bush didn't ask much of the American people, just basically to go out and keep shopping. Next. And when Saddam Hussein was captured, it was in December, which was a nice Christmas gift to daddy. <laughs> Next. And Donald Rumsfeld. I, I, you know, in, I live in Washington, D.C., so, you know, everybody was watching those weekly press conferences he had. And uh, that was, he was definitely the darling of the press in the early days. You know, people watched those things regularly. Well, once the war started, people started questioning, you know, why did we go to war? Uh, you know, the, the shine kind of wore off. So these are, these are really things that he could have said. Um, did I predict Iraq would be a cakewalk? Yes. Did I neglect to plan for a post-war Iraq? The answer is also yes. Did I authorize interrogation procedures which resulted in Iraqi prisoner abuse? You betcha. And that's why the president had asked me to stay on. <laughs> Next. That's great. So Hurricane Katrina. The Bush administration was <laughs> criticized for the reaction to Hurricane Katrina. So this is a play back to 9-11 where George W. Bush was reading to a group of school children, you might remember, a book called My Pet Goat. And that's when um, one of his aides whispered in his ear what had happened. And if any of you have seen some pictures from that time, he had quite an expression on his face. 
and he was told, which could have been the same for Katrina considering the administration's response to it. Next. And when they finally moved all those poor people that had been suffering in Katrina in uh, New Orleans after Katrina, they moved it to a arena in Houston, I believe. And the elder Bush, H. Bush, and Barbara Bush, the former first lady, went and um, and looked around. And this is she actually said this. So many of the people in the arena here were underprivileged anyway. So this is working well for them. <laughs> Next. Uh, you might remember that uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Tony Blair, former Prime, uh, prime Minister, was um, a great ally with George W. Bush and also considered a friend. They went had a press conference together where Bush helpfully said that he knew what type of toothpaste <laughs> the former oh. prime minister used. So I thought, well, this offers an opportunity for a cartoon. Next. And this is based on that iconic photograph, which you, I think you've seen in one of the catalogs here. Um, right after 9-11, Bush went down to ground zero stood on top of a pile of rubble. Uh, the people that were milling around said, well, I can't hear you. He was given a bullhorn and said, I can hear you. Well, once the Iraq war kept going and popular opinion turned against the president and his policies, I thought, well, you didn't hear us. That's good. That's good. And um, the last one. When interrogation methods do result in saving American lives, so I've got the press actually interrogating, which is their job, the president and the vice president. Why are we invading Iraq when Osama bin Laden was responsible for 9-11? Where is the proof Saddam Hussein has WMDs? Specifically, what ties are there between Saddam and Al-Qaeda? Didn't you already decide to go to war in 2002? And I'm just going to end here by saying, you know, I'm sure it's been mentioned in this conference in other sessions, but, you know, the media did not do a great job of holding the administration accountable for the reasons they gave to go to war in Iraq. And frankly, the editorial cartoonists in America didn't either, except for a very few people in the beginning. There were very few editorial cartoonists that actually stood up and did work criticizing and taking on the administration and, frankly, popular opinion. So we, I mean, as a whole, as a group, we did not do a good job leading up to the war. We, we really were kind of late to the game, which was, which was tragic, frankly, because really our, our, you know, that is, we are supposed to be at the forefront of that. This is, this is what we do. So I just want to leave you with that, and um, thank you very much. Okay, so you're going to read it first? The first one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, we've done a number of these things. And this is great. This is the biggest crowd we've ever had. <laughs> so this is amazing. This is amazing. Now, you know, as, as I said earlier, the Bush administration, you know, it was, you know, it was easier for me because, you know, whether you like Obama or dislike him, you know, you at least feel like he's thinking, like he's, okay, this is what we should do. I'm going to consult people. But Bush, he wasn't like that. And, and, and then he had Cheney, and, and he did so many dumb things. And so it was just so great as a cartoonist who thrives on uh, incompetence uh, to, to, to witness this stuff. And I'm just glad we, we got out of it. Uh, we're, we're still, as I'll show you, we're still paying the price. But, uh, this is the Supreme Court of uh, 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 selected uh, Bush, and so I thought it was sort of like uh, you know a a football uh, uh, people in a football stadium you know um, 
Now, keep that up there for a minute. Oh, oh sorry. End of uh, at the end of his term, I did a, 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 a bold out thing in for the New Yorker about things I was going to miss about the Bush administration, and and so this was sort of the final cartoon. And so let me get my glasses. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So this was sort of the uh, way. How, how he evolved, uh, his, it, 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 in cast terms, his, his evolution allowed him to save more and more drawing time and ink. So that after 9-11, you know, I, I was drawing him regular size pretty much. The ears were became a little smaller. Then after he invaded Iraq, he shrunk. Then after Katrina, he starts to lose his feet. They become more like little balls. And then after torture, wiretap, uh, wiretapping Chinese babies, and then after the economic meltdown, he just became just like a, a little little insect type thing. That's great. Thank you. And and so one of the other one of the things that I miss about uh, the Bush administration was his his war on grammar. So in the first panel, he's telling an aide saying saying uh, me the decider, and and the aide says you mean I'm the decider. Not you, I. <laughs> now, you know, that whole run up to Iraq was, was phony. And, you know, they were trying to act like it was something that the world was, you know, behind, which was bull. And so so I, I, I drew uh, Roosevelt, and he's, you know, he's listening, he's saying, United States, America, USA, land of the free, home of the brave, Britain, England, the Brits, Britannia, the British Isles, Australia, the Aussies, the Aussies, the Aussies, the Aussies, the Someone telling me the coalition's bigger than I thought. <laughs> now you know, before we invaded Iraq, we, we you know we had some cordial relations with Saddam at one point, like in the eighties. Uh, so after, so this is what I envisioned after we went into Iraq and he said, "Talk to Rummy uh, 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 Saddam." He's saying, "Rummy, <laughs> no buddy." And Anne alluded uh, to this. Uh, Cartoonists and, and members of the media and politicians, uh, you know, as, as we were going into Iraq, a Democratic Senate, I had great doubts about rushing into this. And trust me, if I wasn't up for re-election, I'd have uh, voiced them. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so then, uh, just so 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 things just backfired. This is a two-panel cartoon. We've got a someone saying uh, the U.S. is Mission accomplishment. And so we just, you know, we pretty much just gave Iraq to Iran. I mean, so an aide is saying, at least, at least demand your silver platter back. <laughs> now, I, I still don't know what the true reason uh, for why we went in to Iraq, but as we were coming up on the 2000th uh, casualty, uh, I was trying to think of a way to 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 mark that, and so this is this is what I came up with: is, is two thousand American soldiers killed in Iraq, and I wrote each of their names out uh, with a question mark in, in, in the word "why." Thank you, thank you. Yes, this cartoon helps us remember. Yeah. So, uh, but but what was what was great about doing First of all, you know, I, 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 I set it off that I would do, I knew how about how much 100 Marines would take. So I did that and said during the weekend when I wasn't dealing with uh, my annoying children, one who was here, um, <laughs> I, would, uh, I, I, would, I would write 100 names out. And then I got it done on, a, uh, on over the weekend, and I knew that by that Wednesday they would amass the last couple names to make it 2,000. So I was going for that, and so I, I showed this to my editor, and and they they 
I had written a bunch of, uh, a, a number of the Latino soldiers that had been killed, and they usually have like three names in there, you know, Juan Antonio Garcia or something like that, and I was just serving six and two. So I, so I had to go back and write out and make them three. And it, so, so they had three different copies of it for each, for each letter. Um, but that was, that's one of my favorite cartoons. Now, there are other things in the Bush administration. For instance, you know, blowing through our surplus with those stupid tax cuts. So I got the, the Bush twins are drinking again. <laughs> And, and Anne alluded to this in one of her cartoons, uh, uh, Barbara Bush's response uh, to the uh, poor people who had been displaced by Katrina in uh, back in Africa. I got her saying, yo, living y large in your new crib. Someone's got a missing brother missing sign. You know, they're just so upset. <laughs> got Bush uh, leading the coalition to defeat Social Security. Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, all the ones that wanted Social Security to be privatized. You know, and he had so many aides that were just like crappy, like this is uh, Alberto Gonzalez, you know, your guy, and I want to spend more time misleading my family. <laughs> and so much of their, so much of their, their terror warnings were were uh, related to politics. So I've got the, the, the John Kerry inaugural, and you see uh, Tom Ridge is uh, uh, doing a, uh, uh, a yellow, you know, whatever that is. But I'm sorry to, to suspect these carolers are politically motivated. And then my favorite uh, uh, character from the Bush administration, uh, I've got Cheney saying, uh, to an aide, inform the leader of the free world I got somebody. Got somebody, <laughs> and and here's here's where I here's where I think Bush went wrong. He didn't you know he didn't rely on experts or knowledge or uh, you know thought. He relied on his gut. He was saying facts. I do what my gut tells me. <laughs> oh, that's the big dictate. <laughs> now now here's the thing. Here's the thing with these cartoons. You know, I'm still doing occasionally Bush-related cartoons because of the lasting impact of his administration abroad on America. So this actually runs tomorrow. Uh, I do this right before I was leaving uh, to come here. I've got ISIS, and I'm gonna they look up to, at the founding fathers of ISIS, Dick, Romney, and W. And then, and then the good times may continue. Uh, Jeb is saying, despite Iraq and the newfound collapse, the Bush brand is tied for a comeback. He says, like the measles. <laughs> so, all right, I'll leave it there. Thank you all very much. Great. So I think time will permit um, a little uh, a live drawing. Um, and maybe not for each and every one of you, but um, but Mike Peters, would you no. like to? Would you like to? No, that's okay. No, that's no, okay. That's no, please, please. I would. I would you, you do this. Yeah. The right. audience demands it. <laughs> yes. Wait, can I just draw really quickly? One yeah. Question? This will take two seconds. Watch. I forgot to include this one that I really like, but I couldn't find it. All right. So, so I drew. I wanted to have it in my batch, you know, but I just I couldn't. I, I'm so disorganized that finding cartoons that are 10 or 11, 12 years old is quite a risk. Um, so I drew, like, you know, Rumsfeld, Obama, and Tommy was right in the middle of the world as in 79, and then three years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then Rumsey over here, and then like the Strauss. I drew them like all carved into the side right. of a mountain, and then and then the caption here was Mount Rushmore. 
Do that. I mean, I'm not going to do something after that. Draw another thing. Draw I'm something not, else. That, that, that would be great. Cool. Mike, come draw something. No, no, no. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Larry, you come up and do something. This is good. <laughs> right. I'll write something. I think what it is, um, the longer a person comes in, um, you pick certain things. Um, uh, like many of us um, uh, did versus years and, and stuff. Uh, I started seeing that he had, now I love this, I love this way because this way is not good, but this way. When I started seeing him then, I would focus on his nostrils, and they and they started getting bigger, and, and it was weird. I mean, you know, it was strange. Uh, uh, I thought it was obviously psychotic. He doesn't have large nostrils, but but it, it was becoming like that. Um, for me, um, you know, I would do his mouth, and I think I would do his mouth, uh, like his upper lip uh, uh, large. When his upper lip got large, his bottom lip got smaller and um, and and no chin. And I said, I like that. I like that because I didn't think he had. There was a, a friend of mine who's Barbara Bush's, or I thought she was Sager's, but she was Barbara Bush's sister. And um, she would always talk about me uh, and, and very good friends. She would always see uh, Bush as a young kid at their house. And um, uh, when he was growing up, and I said to her, now she's a, a big time Republican. Uh, her, the Bush's father came to Dayton and had dinner with them right after he was elected, and then went to go on to a trip. I mean, a big deal, very close. And um, and he said, uh, and, and she said, George was the kind of kid who broke your toys and then blamed you for it. How do you like that? And I never forgot it, and never forgot it. And I learned that the minute he was elected. I said, what do you think about it? Oh, but he was running. And he said, he said, he would break your toys and then blame you. Really fascinating. Oh, and, 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 um, um, okay, and then, um, and then, and then, and, and then I loved his eyebrows. You know, his eyebrows were growing down. And his hair. Now, uh, I had his hair as wavy as some other people did, you know, and then, and then, um, and then the and then the large ears, but now but now you guys, you know, and the thing about the thing about Bush and the thing about other people, other other presidents, all you would have to do is is do the ears, you know, and and you would just kind of do a round circle and then a little thing, and everybody knew, you know, after after he had been on in for a long time, and you know, uh, the ears were the thing. I'm old enough to have done Nixon and. Um, and Nixon's nose had, had gotten had gotten super super long and then his eyebrows and everybody knew Nixon just from that. Um, but uh, let, let me ask this though. Yeah. This the, your two thousand and one W did not look like that. Right? No, this is no, more like no, two thousand eight. No, no, no. Seven, when, when, six, he, seven. when he was getting out because right. because uh, like with with Reagan. I, you know, I don't remember exactly how Reagan was. I mean, I would draw his nose and stuff, and uh, you know, I, 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 you know, somebody could see Reagan, but you know, and so he was always smiling and all that kind of stuff and his chin. But I would do his that little crop of hair, um, and the long, uh, you know, his, his little pomade, his long pomade, 
you know, Papa Bear, <laughs> and uh, and then his large ears. And but the longer he was in, the the bigger this was. Mm -hmm. So then I could do I could do a, a lot more circle, and then do that pompadour, and then people knew it was my regular because everybody takes a little bit of thing and then and then uh, enlarges it and yeah. makes it bigger. And uh, so that's a secret to uh, to many cartoonists. Often people uh, would say, "Draw, draw Reagan, or draw, or draw Bush," and I would say, "You know, I can't do the portrait of him, but I could do my caricature of him, my little, my little hook." And the hook was super easy, and it's very easy for a cartoonist after he's done a billion cartoons about a certain character, and he's enlarging whatever the things are. You know, for Reg uh, for uh, for Clinton, uh, we didn't we couldn't enlarge the thing that everybody thought should be enlarged. So <laughs> so we did something else. But but uh, but uh, but making something large on a on a on a president's face was a, was a, a secret that we often did. Okay, all right, like a, like a bit. Oh, come up here. I think you can do this. Okay, come up, okay. Come up here. Like a bit. Oh, come, come up here and take take a little piece of paper. Larry, are you gonna are you gonna come up and draw? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna this protect is great you. because Larry's gonna come up and draw, and, and this <laughs> is a big deal up. because let's give Larry a big hand. Um, um, okay. All right. <laughs> while, while Larry's uh, taking questions, I'll do a quick uh, Dick Cheney. That's a good way to do it. So he'll draw uh, draw to the question. Um, it, now is the time for questions. I, I I'm going to dispose of my. Uh, prerogative as the moderator to ask the first and go to the gentleman in the back who was the first to raise his hand by the by the way. Why don't you shout? Um, my question is kind of um, a question really in mathematical code of the is there any cartoon, is there any line that you guys see as too much or too little or in your past experience is there anything cartoon that you've seen that you're, you kind of cringe at, but you can't do that. Um, oh, go ahead. You, you go ahead. You know, often, at least I found in my long career, the only ones I really um, uh, wish that I hadn't drawn was when it was thought a positive cartoon about some politician, because they always turn around and bite you on the butt. Um, you know, drawing something good. I mean, like, like uh, you know, I wasn't, I didn't do a bad cartoon about Bush when he was at, at Ground Zero because it was the highlight, I think was the highlight of his presidency. And, uh, and he actually came up with, well, well, about the line. Well, they'll, they'll hear us soon, you know. You know, that was his line. That was a line that nobody fed him unless he had something in his, in his ears, he actually came up with that. And I thought, God, that was a great thing, great thing. What all went downhill from there. And, and not that I did a pro cartoon about him. I did a pro cartoon one time about, uh, uh, about uh, Jerry Ford uh, right after he took over after, uh, after uh, Nixon um, uh, because, I, you know, I, I, it was this cartoon. It was a stupid cartoon. I, you know, it had somebody saying, uh, uh, Martian saying, "Take me to your leader." And, and oh, it's it's you know it's Jerry Ford, you know, to have a leader, you know, to, in there. Uh, and well, I I ate it like uh, three days later when he pardoned pardoned Nixon, and then everybody step, kept saying to me, "What the fuck? I mean, what the hell did you mean by that car? You know that?" So uh, the ones I I feel bad about. No, there is no topic that you don't do. Can I just talk a little bit more? Um, um, often. When there's a tragedy, when there's a tragedy, uh, like um, uh, when a shuttle I I explodes, or when the, um, or or 9/11, or tragedies like that, um, there's a um, a living um, there's a, a living timeline to something like that, where you first uh, Mike drew a fabulous uh, cartoon with a. Uh, uh, on 9/11, with uh, and I'm sure we all did, but I didn't s see many of them. 9/11 um, uh, with the uh, with uh, uh, the Statue of Liberty, and she's crying, and you can see the plane heading for the towers in her in the reflection in, in her eyes. All you can do is do a cartoon about what you felt, what you felt during that time, 
and maybe the next day, maybe the next day doing what you feel about that time. Are you going to sit on my lap? Do oh, you want to talk more about that? Okay. Um, 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 and you feel you feel that tragedy for you know for a number of days, and then after about a, few, a number of days, then you can start asking now why did that happen? Uh, who's at fault? Uh, who did that? You can't do it the day or the next day or maybe even the third day of the tragedy, but sooner or later those questions start and you can start putting those into your cartoons. Um, just real quick. You know, the, the Charlie Hebdo situation obviously was quite a shock for our profession. Um, but really, what really started the conversation about, you know, where you draw the line was the Danish cartoon controversy in 2006. There was a lot of discussion and debate within our profession about, you know, you know where do you, you know, what are you allowed to draw and why are you drawing it? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I have, a, I have a lot of colleagues that I consider, you know, very liberal that, that surprised me during that time because they really did feel that, you know, you shouldn't be creating cartoons that are inflaming people. Um, you know, I, I don't have a problem with, with controversial topics or images as long as, you know, you, there's a reason for doing them. You know, I mean, if it's a really uh, important subject that you have a really strong opinion about, Oh boy, <laughs> um, it's okay. Um, you know, I, I think that sometimes they deserve it, but if you're just doing it just to to get a reaction for no reason at all, then you know that's that's not the correct way to do an editorial cartoon. And having said that, I I am an absolutist. I believe in free speech. There is absolutely no reason for any violence or threats against anyone a cartoonist, a writer, anyone. I don't care what they have said or drawn. So I think that is the real issue that came out of Charlie Hebdo. Okay, we have five minutes. Uh, question? Should have time for a couple more questions. Uh, in terms of presidents or other prominent politicians, have you heard back directly or indirectly, any of you, of someone that you made fun of but turned out that they had a pretty good sense of humor about it? Uh, yes, I have. Um, yeah, you know, I I, uh, I would do cartoons on on Rumsfeld. Thank you, Mike. Um, and and uh, you know, here's the thing. I like a politician when, uh, that gets upset when you do a cartoon. Like I, I knew it used to be in my district in in Georgia in Atlanta, and I did a, a kind of a crappy cartoon, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but I did it. And he told a columnist at the paper that he had to pull over to the side of the road and compose himself because he was so upset about this. I want a divorce. Was no, that was another one. Oh, that was, that was another one, oh. yeah. <clears throat> so, but Rumsfeld, I would do cartoons hitting him, but he would ask a general to, uh, you know, call, call me up and ask if he could have a copy. So that was annoying, but I, would do, I did it anyways. And... Um, and so eventually, when the war first started, uh, 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 who's the woman that was an assistant defense secretary then? Um, she wrote a book. Um, she would, ah, yeah, yeah, in, in, during Bush. Well, she, she called me up and she said, hey, listen, will you come to the Pentagon? Uh, uh, Rumsfeld may need some cheering up or something like that. So, so. Uh, I did. I showed up and uh, spent a couple of days with him and uh, just followed him around. And he was very arrogant, but it was really interesting to be around that guy a at the time. And uh, so I completely forgot what I'm talking about. But, uh, but it was very interesting. Say what? Oh, yeah, he had some cartoons in his bathroom of, of mine. Uh, he wouldn't sit at a desk. He stood up because he... He thought he was cool. And, and also at one point, uh, one of the generals, when, when he would send these requests, uh, uh, call me with these requests, a general said, hey, listen, if you send an extra copy of the cartoon, Rumsfeld will sign it and send it back to you. And I thought, why would I want my own cartoon signed? So, but but it, it got me thinking. So I, did a, I, I made up this thing, and it says, uh, I, I did a little seal, like a, a defense secretary seal with Rumsfeld's face in it, 
you know, from, says, I wrote from the, def, uh, from the de uh, desk of Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and I wrote, this entitles, and a, a blank, uh, 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 this entitles a uh, super patriot Mike Lukovich, uh, use of an M1 Abrams tank uh, <laughs> and free lunch at the Pentagon. Uh, signed, and I left a place for Rumsfeld to sign it. So, you know, I talked to a cartoonist friend of mine, and he said, well, he's never going to sign that and send it back to you. So a couple of weeks later, I get the thing back. Rumsfeld has signed it, but with two addendums. Uh, one, the lunch would not be at taxpayers' expense, and two, the tank would be in a country of their choosing. So that's, <laughs> I still have that hanging up in my house. We can squeeze in one more question, yes. That's you. Oh, well, I just want to say your cartoons in USA Today today. Um, anyhow, the, the one you showed, the last uh, Mike, the last cartoon you showed. Oh, cool! Yeah, it's wonderful. Oh, excellent. Um, and then I also wanted to say uh, thanks from a teacher of social studies uh, mm -hmm. that you make my life much easier with all of your cartoons. But the serious question I had is, um, I wondered um, why are there few women cartoonists in prominent papers? And then I also wondered, in this internet age of uh, women being attacked more on the internet than men are, um, I wondered if you've had any experience um, along those lines that you got more attacks as a woman cartoonist or not. I guess I'll answer that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, which, I mean, I've been in this business since 92. And, you know, there's certain topics that will get response regardless you know, if you're a woman or a man, you know, guns, you know, anti-abortion stuff, any, any of that. But since that, what you're talking about, where women seem, you know, women bloggers or whatever seem to get more attacks online, I, I recently did a cartoon, you know, after the, the Gaza bombings, you know, where, you know, so many children were killed. I did a cartoon, and I really didn't think it was going to be controversial. I mean, I, I was criticizing the Israeli government. Um, and I, it was an animation that I, I do for the Washington Post now. And I happened to do, I fin it was for the Monday morning publication, so, you know, sent it in Sunday not thinking about it, it was published, didn't hear anything. Um, and all of a sudden, midweek, I start getting these emails that are not just, you know, you're an idiot cartoonist. We're talking, you know, stuff women don't want to hear, you know, really. And I thought, what is this? I've never gotten this kind of, not, not like this. And then come to find out, my editorial page editor, Paul Pyatt, was getting phone calls from uh, you know, special interest groups, Jewish groups, you know, complaining and was anti-Semitic and all that stuff. I mean, that's not where I was getting these emails from, but I was obviously getting people that were not happy with what I had done. So that was sobering. I was, I was appalled at that. I actually wrote a blog about it. I just thought, you know, this is just not acceptable. I'll take any criticism, but I'm not going to sit here and recall certain names and describe certain activities to me because I'm a woman and you don't agree with what I just said. So it, it's, it's a bad start. Well, on that high note. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we hope you enjoy uh, and stay for the rest of the conference. And if you're leaving, please drive safely. And a bigger applause for our guests.